We sure were very involved in the Go Zone. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And sure. I know there was also the Liberty Zone. Uh, we weren't involved with that. But the Go Zone, for quite a while, we thought was a pretty great program. Then, as happens with a lot of tax incentive based things, you know, and I don't want to be political here, but the tax incentive kind of starts to distort the market after a while. And the economics sort of fail to be the reason that just the pure economics. And then everybody's like money is flowing for tax benefits. And then things get a little out of whack. Ultimately, I just find that to be true over and over again in life. And so the go zone stopped being interesting to us in the latter parts of it. But but at first, it, I thought it was pretty great. Uh, any comments? On that? In general, when you look at zone based programs, the thing that has ultimately made them unsuccessful has been two big factors. One, their ability to scale, both geographically and in terms of the types of projects you can do. And two, uh, has been their flexibility. This program is unique in that it covers such a big part of the country, much of which is still untouched by capital investment in this program. So there are Still, tons of undervalued assets, the downtowns of entire cities that have now been designated as opportunity zones that can take in billions of dollars of investment in this program. And that doesn't even talk about the business investment sector, where essentially if you move a business or create a new business into an opportunity zone, it now becomes an opportunity zone investable business where you know your returns on the course of 10 years can grow tax-free. And so I think the potential here is far more uncapped than any previous example of uh, place-based investing. We know that the total you know, market of capital gains that you can potentially tap into is $6 trillion, both among individual investors and corporate investors. So you're talking a huge amount of capacity that this program still has to absorb. And you know we're never going to get anywhere close to that. So I don't think you'll see the same natural cap. Uh, in this program, as you've seen in, in other attempts at doing place-based investing. Right. And I know we've got to wrap it up with your part, and we'll talk to your associate for a few minutes here in a moment. But I, I kind of intentionally didn't ask you to explain the program, because we've done several episodes on that previously. But, you know, since you are the chief architect of it, I'd probably be remiss to not ask you if you wanted to tell our listeners about some of the highlights of the program or anything like that, or or just anything else you want us to know before you go? Sure. Well, I always find like uh, a little context is helpful in, in helping to understand why this came about at all. And I'll provide a, a very shortened version of it. If you believe, for example, climate change is the biggest external problem facing this country, the biggest internal problem is this question around geographic inequality. The fact that for the really the first time in our recent history, economic growth during an economic recovery has only accumulated in a very small handful of cities in America. And that has huge ramifications for um, local economies across the country, for health outcomes for people, and ultimately for our, our economic and, and political system. This is the first attempt at its type to create a, an entirely new marketplace out of place-based investing that's designed way different than any other type of program. And it's all tied to appreciation. So this is a program that to be an investor, it starts with having capital gains. You're able to defer the immediate taxes you owe on having sold a stock or a piece of real estate or a piece of art to have gotten those capital gains. But the really big benefit and the really big value for communities is that it aligns the incentives between investors and communities to invest for a very long period of time. For, so for investors who are uh, who stay invested in communities for 10 years or longer, any profits that they see from that investment at the end of that time period, they can earn tax-free. And it's the only part of the tax code that operates that way. It's the only way to get a full step up in your capital gains bill without having to die first, which is a, a benefit of the program. It's the only way you can go from capital gains in business investment to real estate or from real estate to business. So it's a it's a very unique and very powerful incentive that's much more akin to like the charitable contribution deduction in its scale than it is to any previous program. And so this is a big experiment right now around the country of whether this can align the long term uh, strategic interest of communities and their leaders like mayors and county executives around the country 
uh, with investors and with the need that the federal government has to start to dramatically change the way economic growth is working in America. And I think we're going to get to the, the scale and the type of activities and the type of communities where we're going to start to see really powerful transformative changes uh, happening around America. But we, as we mentioned at the beginning, we're in the first inning here, and, and I think people have to be willing to be patient. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out, because some skeptics would say that this will just lead to more gentrification as it upgrades these areas, just pushing prices up and affordability down and pushing the people that ostensibly is to help pushing them out of the neighborhood again, the kind of, you know, like look at Oakland, California, as all the rich tech money has flown in there. I mean, are there any safeguards against that? Or is it going to have that kind of gentrification effect? I mean, gentrification, some people love it, others hate it, right? It depends what side of the economic pie you're on. Uh, But just maybe a comment on that before you go. There are a lot of guardrails, but let me let me start with Again, the premise here, most communities across the country in most cities don't look like Oakland. They don't look like the Bay Area. They don't look like Los Angeles or New York. And the Urban Institute, which, you know, studies gentrification very closely, evaluated all of the opportunities in America and that less than 4 percent of them are at any near term risk of gentrification. So this question of gentrification is a problem that very small number of communities face. It doesn't mean communities don't face displacement, but it's much more common for economic distressed areas to see that displacement come from a lack of capital than not too many, because you start to lose your most talented, well-connected, capable people to other cities because there are just no job or business opportunities in your local community. Now, for certain cities, this is, a, this is a, a big challenge, and there are the same guardrails you have now in that the sort of investments that people are really concerned about in the gentrification conversation are ones that are already very closely controlled by local governments through the use of permitting and entitlements and other land use that dictate what kind of real estate projects can go in and, and what the strings have to be attached to get approved. This program doesn't change any of that. It just provides access to a new form of capital that would have never existed to make a number of projects that were never viable, viable again. And it's really, you know, created to target the places like Detroit and the South Side of Chicago and Cincinnati and Cleveland and Birmingham and Erie, Pennsylvania, which are all active in this marketplace, whose downtowns are, are empty. And they need to start to rebuild th- these 50-year-old bones into modern communities so that businesses will take stock there and and start creating the businesses that will lead to real economic growth. 